How are y'all doing? Well, I get to preach today, and uh, God gave me this message about four weeks ago. Last week, I asked the pastors if you'd please just give me the, the honor and privilege to share about uh, uh, the, the biblical truth of, of uh, life beginning at conception. And some of you may have questions that I just want to show you from Scripture today and also show you from science, from uh, uh, studies uh, done at uh, Princeton University that life begins at the moment of conception. And uh, I know that uh, our world is divided on many, many things, and uh, we don't have to be divisive. And uh, I want to share with you a lot of thoughts around that, but that's not the main point of the message, but it is a point that it has to do with end time events. And there's so many crazy things happening in our world in end time events. I think one of the most abusive things you can do is confuse a child by talking about gender identity and, uh, and confuse them. And that, that's an issue in, in our world. I, I, uh, I uh, going to share several scriptures with you, and I'm going to, and you know, I can't just preach right off the page. And the thing that I, I know what Satan does, and the, the title of the message is his schemes, but Jesus is the victory. The songs that we sang, I Brett must have really been led because the song words are so perfect for the message about Jesus, his victory, and he's the God of all, and all of that. So thank you, Pastor Brett, for the song selections today. And uh, I wanted to share with you that I truly believe, like no other time, that we're in a time when Jesus is going to be coming back. And... Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, Satan, Satan is always, he does two things. He lies and he deceives to, to divide. He wants to divide your marriage. He wants to divide your family. I've never seen so many families where children won't talk to parents, where grandchildren are, are rebellious. They won't talk. They, where brothers and sisters don't talk to each other. He wants to divide people. I and mean, he lies. I'm going to tell you, he tries to divide the schoolhouse, the courthouse, the public square, businesses, friends. Uh, he wants just to divide us. And, uh, and that, that's what he does because if he divides, he can conquer because things that are divided fall. And so he wants to conquer. See, Satan has always wanted to be God. And he, 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 uh, his desire is to rule. And someday he will. He'll enter the temple and everybody will worship him in the middle of the seven years of great tribulation on the world. When God allows it, then people are going to worship Satan. and He's going to do miracles and deceive people. You understand what I'm saying? And, and uh, he's going to, uh, uh, in the meantime, he's making his move because you got to pull down strong nations to rule the world. The world has to collapse. I've been teaching the book of Revelation back here, and I'll be just picking back up here at uh, 11 o'clock next week and also 9.30 next week on the book of Revelation. And in there, two of the chapters talk about the economic collapse and one world economy, one world money system. You know what the debt of America is? Anybody know? 30 yeah, it's like, it's like, 30, it was last, the last I looked in May, like I think of like $32 million, trillion. You know, I, I don't, I'm not a genius, but I can guarantee you our economy is headed toward collapse, but I'm not afraid. You know, we're with to be content, the word says, with food and raiment, food, clothing, and shelter. In, in Matthew 6 and Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which is your assignment to read it every day, Matthew 6, 5, 6, and 7, read it, let it hit you. But I believe with all of my heart that uh, God's going to take care of his own. He's never seen the righteous forsaken or the seed begging bread. But we see end time events all around us, but you know, let, let me show you how he, when he lies to divide, let me show you something. Even in the church, he wants to divide us because we're, 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 we're unified under Jesus. He lies, well, they don't care about you. Well, just call the cell phone. Now, sometimes I forget. I may get it and I can't do it right then, I forget. But you just, love believes the best. The Bible says, well, just call back or text and say, did you get my call? I'm not gonna ignore you. Or you think you sent an email. I'm not gonna ignore your email. Either I've forgotten it, I meant to reply, and something happened, I was, you know, because I'm old and I can forget. Or like Pastor Jeff, this week, poor little Jeannie took a face plant and she's, she can't lay down, she's dizzy, and 
all bruised up. She looks like she got in a fight with Muhammad Ali. And, uh, but you know, there's not one pastor doesn't care. We all have our cell numbers readily available. You know, I, and so, well, that church is too big. Anything healthy grows. Did you know that? And I, 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 I didn't, I, I, I wanted to have a church about two, 300. I started and, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't like a ton of people. More people, more problems. <laughs> more I lay awake at night. But you know, I, I was saying that and we were full in one service and, and some of the guys that are in leadership, the lay people say, we've got to start another service. And I said, I don't like that. There's two different churches and, and too many people. And I said, I want everybody to know me and I want to know everybody. And somebody said, it's not about people knowing you and you knowing them. It's about people knowing Jesus. And I thought, boom, hit me right between the eyes. And then I thought, well, our, after all, our, our vision is heaven. You know, set your affection on things above, not on things of the world. Live for the things that money can't buy and death can't take away. The eternal things that are invisible. That's what our vision is. And uh, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these other things to be added. We need to be heaven focused. And then we need to, to go there. Our mission is to go there and take as many people with us as possible. And our culture is joy. Where every one of us is about Jesus. It's Jesus. Everything we do is about Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And when you, everything is about Jesus and you're fully devoted to Jesus and we stand in awe with hands lifted high, which I'm gonna ask you to do at the close of this service at the altar to declare in one voice, everyone saying, we abandon ourselves and fully surrender ourselves to you and we declare you, Jesus, uh, as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And I, I wanna tell you something. When, when we do that, that's what we need to do. When you put Jesus first and you do that, you're gonna have joy. And you know, when you do put Jesus first and Jesus, you're all about Jesus, you're going to be just like Jesus. And who was Jesus about? You. You're the apple of his eyes. When you have Jesus, you're going to have others that are important. And you're going to value people. That's what Jesus did. To love one another, to forgive one another, to comfort one another, encourage one another, to pray for one another, to build one another up. Right? And to care about other people. When you walk in here, church isn't primarily about you. It's about Jesus. And then secondly, it's about others. You don't need to worry about yourself. Some people say, well, humility is not to think so highly of yourself. No, humility is not to think about yourself at all. Not about you. But you'll be taken care of when Jesus is first. And when Jesus is first, you'll be doing everything you do about others. That's why you get involved and serve. That's why I saw you such a great church because there was hundreds of people helping with VBS. That's why you're a great church because when there's a need for benevolence, people give and we have uh, big offerings. When we have an offering to build a Bible college to teach people in a foreign land, an African country, which we just had for Rebecca Moore in, in the, uh, the, the Congo, the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, we had $62,000 come in and we sent it to her. Can you believe that? that well, I think that's worth, I mean, somebody shout. I mean, I, I, I tell you, the problem with the world is that we have, we're, we're more about church and religion than we are about Jesus. We need to be all about Jesus. I'm all about Jesus. But I want to tell you, Jesus has a victory. I've read the last chapter. We don't have to be afraid. We live in a world of trouble. And Jesus said, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have tribulation. There are going to be problems. It's all in there. Tells you to scare the bejeebers out of you when you read Revelation during the seven years of great tribulation. You know there's going to be 125 pound ice balls come from heaven. Hailstorms. 125 pounds pounding in a storm. That's just one thing. Water's turning to blood. You name it. Disease. Y'all here? I want y'all to go to heaven. I'm going to ask you a question. If you were to die tonight, would you wake up in heaven? Are you sure you're ready? Because the word I got when all this craziness started happening and all the division started blowing up way back in the beginning of the spring of 2020 was don't be afraid. God is God. No time to back up, no time to stand still. Get right with God, stay right with God in charge. The world needs Jesus and needs the hope of Jesus. And I'll tell you, I've never seen a time in my life when it's so obvious that Jesus is about to come through those clouds and bust open and be here. 
2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, talking about Jesus coming back, says this, and see if it doesn't describe our world. Mark this, starting in verse, uh, verse 3, I think. Let's see. Verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1. But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. You think? Selfish? Lovers of money. Materialistic? You think? I mean, some of you, you can't come to church because you got so much money, you're always doing something else. When I was a kid, people didn't miss church except for their two weeks of vacation and they were here. They didn't just have money and run off here and there, putting pleasure in the things money can buy. I'd like to challenge you. Why don't you just miss four Sundays next year? See how easy that is for you. I mean, the local church is where you come to love your, your, love your fellow man and to be in the body of Christ. Pray for one another, be there to serve, to minister, to help. And how many times have we said serve one and tend one? How many people actually serve one? And you can get up, when Jesus died on the cross, you can get up and get here at 8.30 and serve in the nursery. Or oh, 8 o'clock rather. Most people come at 8.30. <laughs> anyway. Lovers of money, boastful. Man, is that a problem. Proud, abusive. Oh my goodness. The... Human trafficking, unbelievable. You know, if I was president, I'd make a lot of things illegal that you do. I'd be a dictator for righteousness. But you know what? It wouldn't change because you can't affect what a person chooses to do from the outside. I watched this thing on the making of America and how much sin there was in gambling and, and sex trade and, uh, and the uh, uh, alcohol when during Prohibition. Uh, Jack Daniels, they got around selling alcohol. You know how they did it? They sold the ingredients for alcohol, a home kit, so you'd go home and make it. And the mafia and running numbers. Chicago would run in numbers. It's called gambling. And the government in Chicago shut down the running numbers thing where they were making millions of dollars and said it's illegal to do that. And then the government started the lottery, which is exactly the same thing that the people running the numbers were doing. We've had corrupt government a long time, folks. I remember a governor in this state that said, we'll never have gambling here. I'd make gambling illegal. You couldn't buy those little scratch off things if I was president. But anyway, I don't know. I don't want to be president. I'm too tired. <laughs> people hate presidents. A lot of people do. Well, where am I? Abusive. Duh. Disobedient to their parents. Do you think? Ungrateful. Huh. Entitled, not grateful. Unholy. You know, the Jews didn't have the spirit within. They weren't born again. They just had the word. But the Bible, they did what the Bible did. They memorized the law, first five books. They memorized the prophets and they memorized the Psalms. And they meditated and they were strong and they lived more holy than people that have the Holy Spirit because we don't take the word serious. Are you with me? I mean, the church being holy? What? Can you believe what's on the televisions and what's in the movies? Well, you're talking about unholiness all around the world. It's crazy. Without love, I've never seen so much hate. Unforgiving, even people in the church, you can talk about it till you're blue in the face. But unless the Holy Spirit puts grace in their heart and forgiveness, it won't happen. You can know to forgive, but you can't do it without God. Slanderous, without self-control, People are out of control, going crazy all over the world. Brutal, brutality, oh my goodness. People just murdering people right and left. It's unbelievable. Not lovers, and that's because of depravity of the heart. Sin sick heart. That's why all that brutality. Not lovers of good. They, they, they really enjoy the sin. You know, they like to watch the sin. They not do it, but you like to watch it. Treacherous, rash, conceited, love of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. And I already mentioned that. You know, we just, we got to go have our pleasure. 
Having a form of godliness but denying its power have nothing to do with such people. Having a form of godliness but denying the power is going, we'll have our theology and what we believe and we'll stick by it, but we don't really have the spirit that changes our heart. The power of God changes your heart. And therefore we go, you know, I was born angry, I can't help it. No, God can help it because the fruit of the spirit is self-control, right? So I'm, I'm gonna tell you that God inside you changes you. Salvation isn't just a ticket to heaven, it's a regeneration, a rebirth, a change of a heart, getting us to see what God sees and giving us the desire to do what God says to do. He changes our heart, that's the power of God, that's the power of grace. It awakens us from lostness. But we're living in the last days. Sin is abounding like never before. I just, I, I, I can hardly stand it. I mean, I can't even understand human trafficking and all of the pornography and all of the, what's on the airways and the way people talk. And, and you know, when I was a kid, you remember Gone with the Wind and, and you know, they, they used that one word that begins with a D and the whole world went, all America went crazy. Now it doesn't matter who you are, coach, public official, who it is. You just curse freely right on the airways. Use God's name, use the F word. It's ridiculous to eat the evil, the sin that's abounding in our nation. And there's disease, like it says, pestilences, there's earthquakes and hurricanes, signs in the sky, you know, and, and increasing like never before. And talk about knowledge increasing. I mean, used to, you'd have to like take it by faith that the Bible says that the whole world could watch the two dead witnesses of God and rejoice that the, people, the two men of God are dead in that tribulation time when, when Satan is ruling as God. They all watched. Well, now you don't have to worry about that. You don't need any miracle to watch it. We've got satellites and the whole world can beam in whatever's happening anywhere for the whole world to watch on a, on a tube. Knowledge increasing is unbelievable. I don't even go on there. Uh, technology uh, uh, has got spying capabilities to see you anywhere from space. We have the technology now to have a cashless society to put chips in us, to track us, to put chips to, so that we can make pay for things. We, and you're talking about having a one world government, a one world religion, and a one world money system. That's what it talks about when I'm teaching the Revelation. Revelation 17 and 18, it talks about all of that. Satan's gonna be the God of this world. He's gonna rule. We're gonna, you won't be able to spend or buy or sell or anything else without the mark of the beast, which I don't know what that is. It's a mark, it's his number. And then, uh, uh, you, you, you know, there's gonna be a, a one, 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 uh, uh, re one religion, one world monetary system, and one, one world government. He's gonna rule. We already have food shortages. You think Ukraine and what's happening over there is helping? How about Russia? We have a problem. We have hyperinflation and that inflation we got our national debt, I wrote it down, 30.49 trillion as of May. And, uh, and a great falling away from God, and yet at the same time, God's stirring. So there's miracles. You know that in the last week, every week for a long time, we have an absolute God bona fide miracle. We don't always tell you about it, but it's happening. Andy Foster, I mean, they told him this cancer was incurable and he's cancer free. It's an absolute miracle of God. <laughs> Says on the back in the eight o'clock. And I'm gonna tell you that uh, uh, there's hatred, which is another sign, there's war, and uh, uh, there's this spirit of antichrist that's been in the world from the beginning that wants to rule. And I will tell you, communism, there's no such thing as socialism. Socialism has a ruling class that never goes by the rules of everybody else. It will just, it's called taxation to a point where it's unbelievable and they tax so much, they take your money and then they redistribute it because no one really deserves to live in wealth unless they are. And we have politicians that think making almost $200,000 a year is poverty level. Just listen to them talk. No reality. I'm not, I'm not, I hope everybody makes a million dollars. I'm, I'm fine, the righteous. I'm not against making a lot of money. All I'm saying is we have an entitled perspective and, and a selfish perspective and it's all over everywhere. And, and you know, this Putin is a 
top of Antichrist. So was Hitler. So was the guy in Cuba, the guy in North Korea, and other people, world rulers. And from the beginning of time, there's been people that want to rule the world. Who is that? That's Satan. Who wants to be God? Who wants to rule people? Who wants them to bow down? That's Satan. It happened when, in, when the big uproar in, in, in heaven, when Satan and his third of his angels wound up. Or now we got those angels here, they're demons, and Satan is running loose, and he's trying to enter man, and he does enter man, and he possesses man, and he, and he hates God's people. Why? Because God loves you. And he hates sinners because God loves them. He hates mankind. But he wants them to worship him. He's not against religion. He just wants to be the God of this world. And he is the prince in power. But he doesn't have final authority. Jesus does. I know the end of the book. He's the victor. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. Satan doesn't win. There's trouble between now, now and then. And there will be. And I think God has to step back and let Satan have his heyday for the end time to come. Because he's blocked him in other times. And until God allows Satan to get to a place where he rules it's not going to happen because God's the one in charge of when all the end time things come to pass. But I'm telling you, folks, it's a looking awful like the time could be any day. And I'll tell you, it'd be unwise not to live as if he could come tomorrow or right now. It's going to be, you're just going to be sitting there a normal little day and then suddenly, boom, those that are ready are going to disappear. They're going to fly away and others are going to be left. I don't know how they're going to explain it away. I think maybe there's not that many people left on earth that really are born again. We've got a lot of religious people that fall under the, the rule of the Bible and the theology of the Bible, but don't have the spirit of Christ and never been born again and don't walk with the fullness of Jesus. I think there's a problem in our land that way. That's why there's no power, no holiness. God is a holy God, and God's people are a holy God, and God's word is holy, and his spirit is holy, and he demands holiness. And yet we want to live as close to the world and do anything else that, that, that we want to do. And, and, and let me tell you something. Just because you don't agree with something, just because you don't like something, you can't just put, pick and choose what's in this book. And what you think doesn't change God's eternal truth. The Bible says that the word of God abides forever. His truth is, is forever. And he does not change. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what was sin when God first made the world is still sin today. And it doesn't change. That's all, that's all there is. So I'm telling you, Satan has got schemes, and I think those schemes eventually will destroy anything that stands together. He comes against your marriage, against your family, against schoolhouse, against everything to destroy because he hates and he wants to, he wants to lie so he can divide. Let me tell you, lies that we don't care, just call, and it's already said that. I don't think he lies that we're all about money. Let me tell you something about money. Jesus is the one that said it, not me. You know what Jesus said? He said, where your heart is, your treasure is. You, where your money goes is where your heart is. So it's about heart. And in this church, in case you knew and don't know, we can't see what you give. I don't know what you give because I wouldn't be able to say what I think looking at you because I'd be knowing the people that give a lot and I wouldn't want to ever offend them. They could do something wrong and I wouldn't want to say anything. Well, I'm going to say the same thing to them I'm saying to you because I don't have a clue who's given what. All I know is that the offerings are bigger than they've ever been. That's all I know. I just assume everybody's tithing. But let me tell you, some people say, well, the Old Testament says that that's just an Old Testament principle. No, it's not. Jesus was condemning the, high, the priest and the, all the Pharisees saying, you know, you're so proud that you give your tithe to the mint and everything. You give your tithe. He says, but you leave the weight of your things undone of grace and mercy and, and love and kindness and truth. You leave the stuff that's more spiritual undone. He says, he says you got to do that too. He says, yes. And then he says, Jesus says, you did the right thing paying the tithe, but you left this undone. You need to do it too. He, he affirms the tithe. And I'll tell you, if you know you should be tithing and you're not, God's not going to bless you. In fact, the Bible in Malachi says he's going to pour, he's going to, you're you're under a curse. Malachi says he pours the, opens the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing when you honor him. You trust God. But see, we're so materialistic, we got to have our money for everything. We got to have a certain kind of car, certain big kind of house, certain this, certain that, we got to travel. And we don't have money. We don't have money for God. That's enough on that. That wasn't even my notes. That's just free right there. But it is, it, is, it, is part, it is part of this selfishness that's talking about, and lovers of money. It just shows where your heart is. Something's wrong with your heart spiritually. Uh, and I'm not going to judge you, but read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. We're living in the last day. That's my point. So one thing, take notes. We live in a world of fear. You know who said we have nothing to fear but fear itself? 
Franklin Roosevelt, March 4, 1933, it was said during the Great Depression, the inauguration speech. Let me tell you something. We're not people of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. There's nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. We need to not be people of fear. We need to be people of hope and faith and love. We live in a divided world. Abraham Lincoln said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. In June 16, 1858, the Republican State Convention in Illinois, he was running for the, as a Republican candidate for the U.S. Senate. And he said this in his speech there. And it was thought that his uh, uh, Democrat opponent had used that against him of what it meant and what it said and twisted that. And his friend said, you got to speak up and say, I didn't say that. God said that because you see that statement is in three of the gospels. Jesus said a house divided against itself cannot stand. But Abraham Lincoln said, no, I'm not going to blame it on God. I believe it and I'm going to stand by it, win or lose. And he lost that election. But about six years later, he won the presidency because of that stand because he was speaking about America being divided over racism and about slaves and about some of the states they were for slavery and some were against it. He said, this isn't gonna work. We're gonna divide, we're gonna fall, we're gonna crumble. We have some of those divides today. I'm gonna tell you, I believe that. And I believe that's the devil's trick is to destroy families and marriages and all kinds of institutions for good by lies, by jealousy, by whispering, by suggesting, by, by uh, questioning a person's motive, by whispering about it, and by breaking things down. And whisper about me all you want. I'm not afraid to die. We live in a divided world. We live in a selfish world who said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. John Kennedy, President John Kennedy. The day we go, what can the government do for me? What can this do for me? What are you going to do for me? It's all about me, me, me. And I've already addressed the Jesus culture that it's about Jesus, about others, not about you. And uh, we have a world that, that's entitled, that has their hand out, all about what the government can do for them. We need to rise up and... Uh, and, you know, we've always been a compassionate people to help the down and out. I'm all for it. Their church gives over $100,000 to, to benevolence and helps people all the time. I believe in that. Those that are down and out, they're sick, they have cancer, they can't work, whatever we can do to help. Uh, we help people within our church. We help people without the church. I'm thankful for your love and your care about people. We live in a world where Satan wants to rule. You know, he wants to rule. So he puts this spirit of communism. I, I, was, I was in Poland. You know, I saw where there was communism and talked to the people that lived through it when they said there was nothing in the shelves, but we went to work because we got our money, but we had nothing to sell. It was empty. And then I saw the freedom and I saw the marketplace booming there. And communism is a horrible thing. And unfair taxation, which I think we have already, is not right either. I mean, it tax everything, tariffs, you name it. All the while, there's so much waste and cheating and stealing and pilfering and in government at every level. Because people are full of themselves and selfish, like this Bible says the end times it'll be. But we live in a world where Satan wants to rule, and we've had different people that want to rule, like Gorbachev. Who said this? Gorbachev standing, standing by the wall. Gorbachev, tear this wall down. In my opinion, the greatest president that ever walked to the earth, Ronald Reagan. Now, there's probably some other good presidents, and your opinion can be different than mine. I don't care. It's not Bible. But I like to every once in a while just say something <laughs> that I think. Who said this? Give me liberty or give me death? Patrick Henry. That was when the English soldiers were already on the soil. And he says, listen, there's nobody else that's their enemy here. It's us. They're going to they're gonna imprison us. They're going to throw us in. They, they're going to take us over. They want to rule us. He said, no, it's too late. We're standing. Either we're going to die or we're going to fight for liberty. And let me tell you, Ukraine's doing that right now with Russia. You know, God's helping them. Did you, you see the news? Yeah. 
you know, the Russians in the sea have this, have this floating bomb, you know, mine. And their biggest warship that takes planes, hit it and blew up, sunk. Yeah, Russia's plane sunk. I don't like Putin. He's an antichrist type guy. And there's a lot of people to take his place and there's people that want to do that in America. Let me tell you something before I leave at my liberty. I'm not letting this world, this country, myself be taken over by a tyranny or any kind of tyrant or any kind of dictator. All right? I don't care who it is. Unless it's me. I mean, that's okay. I'll do, I'll do the right thing. I'm, that's a joke. I mean, I may be in my wheelchair and I might be 90, but I'm going to be sitting there going, you ain't taking the freedom from my children and grandchildren. I'll fight to my death. That's what I believe. I believe that much in liberty. And you know, the Bible's full of liberty. Do you know that? Freedom. It does. Who the son says free is free indeed. And he wants us to be free to worship him. But there's nations where that's not there in the midst of it. And that was when Jesus lived on earth. His nation wasn't free. And his, and his friend said, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? The Romans, the stinking Romans, they're horrible. You know, I don't understand that all, all I know is this. I'm not afraid. And I know I can see, I've seen in my lifetime and that trip I took over to Poland and to take a look at what, what uh, communism does changed me forever. And I'll fight till I die to, to hold forth freedom and liberty. And I believe in liberty, 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 liberty in Jesus Christ. So Satan's scheme is to lie, to divide so he can rule. We see it clearly. And it's going to lead to the return of Jesus Christ because it's going to break things down where Satan can rise up and say, I got the answer. And then everybody's going to want to, want to worship Satan. He's going to deceive people and do miracles and be deceived. And I plan on flying away before that white somewhere in there before all that goes down. Remember, it's about Jesus. And we're about making disciples. And we're about sharing the gospel of Jesus. And we're about preaching and then teaching people to observe all things he commanded. It's the Great Commission to win people to Jesus and teach them, to disciple, teaching them to observe. And with that goal, to reach and teach, we have a biblical responsibility to speak to the word to the world on important justice issues of the day, including abortion. So I want to teach you. Maybe you don't understand. Maybe you've, you, 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 you are taking a look at things. So I, I, want to, I want to teach you something here. First off, there's a study in science from Princeton University that says life begins at the moment of conception, scientifically. And it, it, it undoes several myths. Let me read a couple of them. Myth, the product of fertilization is simply a blob, a bunch of cells, a piece of the mother's tissues. And uh, it says that uh, the human, the truth is the human embryonic organism formed at fertilization is a whole human being and therefore it is not just a blob or a bunch of cells. This new human individual also has a mixture of both the mother and the father chromosomes. So therefore it is not just a piece of the mother's tissues. And it goes on to say that the immediate product of fertilization myth two is just potential or possible human being not real existing human being. And it says, as mentioned above, scientifically, there's absolutely no question whatsoever that an immediate product of fertilization is a newly existing human being, and it gives a detail. If you want this, I'll send it to you. You send me a text or an email, and I will forward this, this statement because it goes into a lot of detail scientifically. And these are not coming from a Christian point of view. These are scientists. These are PhDs at Princeton that study when it begins. And here's what I believe. I believe life begins at conception. I believe that with all of my heart. And while, you know, I believe that, I also believe that as a church and as Christians, we value women and their rights as well as we value a baby that, at the conception, meaning Jesus valued women. And, but to put a woman's right to abort over the baby's right to live is not an option. 
I mean, what, at what point, and here's what I'm concerned about, this ruling went back to the states, and my heart's kind of broken, and I, I'm, you know, I'm going, okay, but, you know, someone did a, like, looked at it and think it might reduce abortions by 10%, but, but we have states that, and insurance companies are going to pay for you to drive and stay in a motel and take care of it in another state. A lot of states are not going to do it. And even in our own state, I don't know if this is true or not, but I understand that they're kind of looking at the six-week rule. Well, six weeks, six weeks, uh, one day before six weeks, one day after six weeks, two days. I mean, when is, when is it a life? You see, they, th that study even says that at conception, when the egg is fertilized at that very moment, the gender is set, male or female. I mean, at what point is it okay to not let what has been conceived grow into a human being? At what point? You know, most of everyone in the world might go, you know, you don't be pulling babies out at nine months or eight months or seven months. What about six months? What about five? What about four months and three weeks? How about four months and a week? How about three months? How about three months and two weeks? What about two months? What about six weeks? And so I literally am grieving over the fact that while there's some encouragement there, it's concern. And I, I, was, I want to tell you that, that uh, uh, you know, Jesus never publicly shamed people for their sins. The woman caught in the adultery, remember how he treated her? The woman married in John 4 to several husbands and then was living with someone out of wedlock. He offered grace, he offered forgiveness. He, he, he spoke truth, he called them the repentance, but he wasn't ugly. And I'm thankful that in this church, when we've had young people or someone have a child outside of wedlock that I've never ever known of anybody shaming them. And I'm thankful for Embrace Grace out of this church that supports people and helps them with physical things, helps them with, with the, the real life stuff to help them be able to not just value life to birth, but value life after birth and help, help these mothers. And I'm thankful that some of our people that have had babies put them up for adoption realizing it didn't work for them and there are people that would love to adopt and and you know I, I think there's people right now needing to be adopted and maybe some of you younger people need to get with it give as much family and speak, step up to those that are living that need 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 a family and I don't I don't know the statistics on that but I know there's a lot of people in line that love to have a family instead of being in the system and I, I know that, uh, you, know, G, you know, our church is never like, you know, marginalized or like been ugly to a person that's living in sin or that any other thing like that. But we've showed kindness. And the Bible says in Romans that, that chapter 2, I think it is, it, it talks about that God's kindness and patience uh, it, toward us is what leads us to repentance. And how can we not offer that to other people? And I thought of the story of recently, and I backed into Christy Marshall's car. I was late, and she had parked it up by her garage, and I, she didn't know I was there because I'm usually gone, but I was helping do some stuff, and she was at our house, and I, how, how, I, how I could walk out and not see her car parked right close to our garage, and I'm right there, and I just jump in and back up, and before it could beep, I just go boom, and then my hit just hits her car and just knocks the tar out of it, and I'm going, how could you be so stupid? And, I'm, and I guarantee you, if Susan had done that, I'd have been all over her, you know, like, that was dumb. What are you thinking? Where are you at, woman? But she didn't do that to me, nor did Christy. And I thought, you know what? We like it when people are merciful and kind and gracious and good to us and it shows God's favor. But we don't always want to, that's not our first response for others. But God, God wants to draw people. Now that doesn't mean you don't tell truth. You tell the truth. Truth, truth is not mean. You stand up for truth. Truth marches on. It's got to. But Satan has a scheme. In Ephesians 6, 5 to 20, I'm going to just skip down to verse 10. Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. 
Put on the full armor of God that you can take stand against the devil's schemes. There's the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. I mean, we, we have a formidable foe. Satan is, we need to resist him and draw nigh to God, it says, to, to battle this. It says, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth. Let me tell you, always keep truth. Truth doesn't change. It's the same. Jesus the same yesterday, today, forever. Uh, breastplate of righteousness. In the way you live righteous and in, in your position righteous through faith and grace of Jesus Christ. Breastplate, protect your heart with righteousness, live right. And your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, to ready to preach the gospel. In other words, the way we beat the devil is give the gospel, win souls. We win them. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. Listen, when it looks like all things are going on, don't give up faith. Let me tell you, the devil will lie to you, tell you you've done too much, you can't be forgiven. Don't believe the devil, keep your faith. There's eternal life for you through Jesus Christ. You can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. That's his schemes. That's his lies. That's his deception. You can defeat the evil one. The flaming arrows of the evil one don't have to destroy you. Keep the sword of the Spirit. It says the helmet of salvation. Know that he's going to tell you you're no good. You're rotten. You can't be forgiven. Don't let your mind go there. You believe Jesus and keep the sword of the Spirit. That's the weapon. And what is it? The Spirit of God uses the Word of God. The sword is the word. This is how we conquer the devil. When Jesus beat the devil, he quoted scripture. Man shall not live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. He quoted scripture to Satan when he was truly tempted, being tempted. And he, if it, it wasn't a true temptation if Jesus wasn't fully man as though he were not God at all. If he couldn't have fallen for the temptation, then it wasn't a true temptation. The Bible says in all ways like we, he was attempted and he was brought to sin and he had to, by the spirit and by the word and be close to God, resist it. And Jesus lived a sinless life. And there's victory in Jesus. See, Satan's scheme is to uh, lie and divide so he can rule. And I'm gonna tell you, we need to remember not to give in to his scheme. The Bible says in Genesis 1, 26 and 28, referencing a child that we're made in the image of God. And it says this, God said, let us make mankind in our image and our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them both Male and female, he created them. Male and female. And he breathed the breath of God's spirit in Genesis 2-7. Genesis 2-7 says, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And we are knit together and known by God while still in the womb. Let me tell you something. Most of you don't know this. I've never said this. But I had two brothers, and then I, my mother was told not to have another child because it would kill her. But she got pregnant, and it almost killed her. I said, don't you dare do it. I mean, it, it about killed her. And she, that baby that she had died, did not live, okay? And uh, was sick. So I said, don't you ever get pregnant again. I'm a oops. I'm an oops. She, I didn't have a say whether I, she kept me, but she did. And I believe before my mom, I was in her womb, God knew me. And that God had a plan for me. And that my mom had taken me as a blob because she was afraid of her life. Perhaps I wouldn't be here. Did she, did she almost die? Yeah, she gave birth to me. And for two months, she couldn't hold me. She was in the hospital, she almost died. But she loved me and she was thankful for me. And I don't understand it, but in the divine sovereignty of God, He chose me before I was. In Psalm 139, 13 and 14, it says, You created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. Praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know it full well. And then another verse that 
Proverbs talks about taking innocent life. It says, well, wait a minute. I wanted to do Jeremiah 1.5. Jeremiah 1.5. Jeremiah says, but God says about Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. This is how I feel about God with me. Before he formed me in the womb, he knew me. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as the prophet to the nations. Proverbs speaks against taking innocent life. In Proverbs 6, 17, we need to protect innocent life. It says, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. God hates. God hates it. In Proverbs 31, 8, it says we need to defend, speak biblical truth to defend those who can't defend themselves. In all abortion debates, the only group without a voice is the unborn. To speak up for those who cannot speak up for themselves for the rights of all who are destitute. Do we as pastors have people coming to us seeking counsel about abortion? Sure. Sometimes they come because they talk about giving up their baby for adoption and we've helped them. That's happened. Sometimes because they were raped. Sometimes because they're in their early teens and scared to death. Sometimes they've been told by doctors that either the mother's life or the baby's life is in grave danger. Our heart is to give them help and support for options that lead to life. I'm glad our church supports Agape Pregnancy Center in Ruth Harbor, who house, care for, counsel, and support women, often teens facing unplanned pregnancies. We don't have to choose between supporting the unborn and supporting women. Jesus said there's no difference between male and female. The Word says that. Women, you're not second rate. You're different. But we're the same. We all need God and God values you. But we need to take a Christ-like, Christ-centered Bible approach to making a positive impact for the unborn and for loving women and helping them in their crisis. The Bible stands against abortion as out of love and care for the child in the womb. Just remember that. The Bible in the kingdom of God values all human life. It's not prejudice. There's no prejudice in the Bible. The world may label you, disrespect you, and people do it all the time. There's racial prejudice. There's class prejudice. There's gender discrimination. There's age discrimination. But God never discriminates. He's not prejudiced. And Jesus, as his followers, we can't discriminate on the basis or show prejudice of any of these things. So standing for the sanctity of life and the right of a baby in the womb to live isn't a statement against women's rights. It's a statement for the rights of a baby. And I'm thankful for God's mercy. And by His mercy, there are millions of babies that I believe that entered into heaven who never had the opportunity to live on earth. You may disagree with me, but I think God took these little ones. And some of you have had miscarriages And because I believe at the moment of conception, there's a life. I believe you're miscarried babies with the Lord. And if you suffered an abortion and you didn't know or you were in trauma and you have regrets, just know God forgives you. God loves you. God's for you. We're not mad at you. It's okay. We'll have to just move forward. Sadly, America is divided on this and so many other things, and there's so many people that are extremely happy, but so many people that are so angry. I don't understand people that get angry and (coughs) kill a doctor because he does abortions or or (coughs) do physical destruction to an abortion clinic or vice versa, attack life clinics or churches that believe in, in Conception begins at life. What is wrong with people? You know, as I said before, you can make something against the law, but if the heart doesn't change, people's behavior and choices won't change. They'll find a way to do their sin, just like their prohibition. Read Romans 2, 3, and 4. And remember, that God's kindness and tolerance and patience is toward you, that we might all repent. So I ask you again, if you were to die, would you awake in heaven? Are you ready? Would you go to heaven? If you were to die today, are you ready? See, our human thinking and our human reasoning will never change God's eternal truth. 
don't ever forget it. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But as we stand for truth, remember Paul's words in Colossians 3.14. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us together in perfect harmony. And without the Holy Spirit and its fruit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, self-control, goodness, kindness, without the Holy Spirit fruit, truth is powerless. And without truth, the Holy Spirit has no sword. For it's the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. They have to work together. Truth and Spirit. And you know, there's no truth without love, and there's no love without truth, and they're not contradictory. Speak the truth, live the truth. Our unity in Jesus, our missions, our unity is Jesus. Our mission is Jesus-centered. Our lifestyle should reflect Jesus. Jesus is perfect love, and he's perfect true, and there's no conflict. We know we're going to have Antichrist rise up to rule the world. And what do you say? What do you take from this? What do you take from this? Well, let me, let me give you the action points. Take a picture on the screen here. Number one, get ready for Jesus' soon return. The Bible says, he that has this hope purifies himself as God is pure. Get ready. Jesus could come any day. Let's live ready every morning. Quit filling yourself with just secular stuff that's no good for you spiritually. May not be sin. Too much. Too much sports. Too much this. Too much light time. Too much everything of pleasure. Secondly, read and study the Word and teach it to your family. Don't compromise truth. Parents, grand, teach it to your children. Grandparents, teach it to your grandchildren. Make it a part of your life. How long has it been since you've even picked up the Bible and read it? When's the last time you memorized a verse? When have you meditated on a passage and thought about it deeply? And then third, make a plan to lead people to Jesus. The Bible says, work while it is day, the night comes when no one can work. And I'm telling you, working and serving, whether you're singing in the choir, teaching, you're witnessing, you're loving, make a plan. Figure out a way to get people to understand Jesus and his truth and his salvation and his grace. The next thing is to put on that armor so you don't fall for Satan's schemes. Resist the devil and draw near to God. He will flee from you. And lastly, let's rejoice and keep the faith because Jesus wins. Amen. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. Would we stand together and declare it? How many of you love it that I preach forever? <laughs> liars. No, I'm kidding. But well, they say liars will be friars. You know, I, I want all of you in heaven. Now, maybe I've said something you don't quite agree with. You know, I still love you. I'm not going to throw you out. You need to treat everyone that way. But, I, but I'm sorry. I have to be true to what I believe. And the rule for my life is the holy word of God. Because how, does, how do we establish what is true if you don't have a standard that's this? And I've studied enough to know the reality of Jesus and his life and his death and his resurrection. It's proven outside of biblical text. It's proven in literature and history. Even people that hated Jesus, they said we can't deny his resurrection because everyone knows it. Did you know that? Every other God, their Savior's dead. The person they follow is dead. Jesus is the only living one. And he's the king of kings and lord of lords and because he lives we too should live and he gives you eternal life would you bow your head if you're here today and you're not sure you'd go to heaven you've never really had your heart changed you've never really turned to bow your knee before jesus as lord and master and king of kings you've never done that and you need jesus to save you and forgive you and give you an assurance of eternal life would you just lift your hand really quick right now as i look around anybody here i need jesus as my savior online if you're here and you don't know jesus would you please reach out to him would you please call on the name of Jesus. He will change your heart. He will change your mind. He will give you eyes to see things through his spiritual discernment, to see truth of this word. He'll help you. I can't help you. I can't convince you. All we can do is argue, but in the spirit realm, God can help you. Father, for those calling on you today, Jesus, forgive them. Take away guilt and shame. You're not a God of guilt and shame. You're a God of grace and mercy and forgiveness. And you come to save us. Change their hearts. Give them a new desire. God, help them, Lord. Tear out the heart of flesh and selfishness, God, and pour in the heart of love and spirit, God. And may the word of God come alive. And may they begin a living relationship with Jesus, with you, Lord, that they would know you and follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. This is our declaration. I would like it for as many as you could to 
If you come, come all the way to the front and spread all the way out to together raise our hands. Say, well, Pastor, you can't tell us to do that. I, I'm just saying we're making a declaration as a church, as a whole, to sing this song. Now look at the words as we begin to sing it. As we begin to sing it, if you'd like to come, I'm not going to make you. I'd love to see us make a declaration to the world this right here. Hallelujah. If you mean that, can you put your hands together and declare Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, heaven is ours, his victory is won, Satan is defeated, he has no authority here, amen? No authority. In the name of Jesus, Jesus is the victor, amen? amen. I want to see y'all in heaven and everybody you love, I want to see them in heaven. Your kids, your grandkids, your neighbors, your co-workers, your schoolmates, I want everyone in heaven. Do you want that? So let's work until he comes. The, day, the night's coming when no man can work. Let's get as many people in the kingdom of God as possible. Amen? Amen. All right.